Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, any questions uh, before I talk about a couple of logistical things? Okay, so biggest thing, um, homework one, uh, I'm gonna assign today. So you can download it from the homework page. Um, so you should be able to do the first, I think three-ish um, already and we'll, We'll, we'll cover we'll cover the uh, what's necessary for the fourth one in in class today. Um, so that's that. There's also a LaTeX template that you can download that you can use if you would like. Um, and you'll upload it on on Gradescope. Like the like the worksheet, uh, it looks like twenty five people have already uploaded for the worksheet too. So seems like people are being able to do that. If you have any questions, just let me know, and I can uh, I can help you out. Okay, and depending on how things go, if we get through the worksheet, then it'll be due on Friday. If not, then it'll be due next Friday. But worksheet two will be due this Friday. Okay, uh, I think that's it for logistics. Any questions that have come up in your brain since then? So last lecture, we uh, we started talking about Andal's law, um, and the key the key observation with Andal's law is that our optimizations are not going to uniformly affect uh, the entire program. So we went through this example where. Uh, we had a, a a program, and we could we have this these new instructions that allow us to do JPEG decode ten times faster. But the JPEG decode portion is only one third of our program runtime. So when we uh, actually use this new thing and and reduce it by uh, by ten times, reduce the runtime by ten. Uh, 10 times here. In this case, it's pretty easy, right? It's all just, you know, it's 10 seconds, so it goes down to one second. Um, we end up with a speed up that is only 1.42x rather than the, the 10x that's advertised. Um, and that's just because there's a bunch of other stuff going on. So, We might, you know, need this performance boost though, and um, there we, we can make up different metrics for how much we care about cost versus latency. Um, and if we use just cost times latency, then we get that it's not worth the increase. Otherwise, if we use uh, latency squared, then it will be worth it. So let's look and see how that pans out. So. These are both smaller, better metrics. You don't want much cost, and you want you want low cost and low latency. Um, so we're we're going to end up with a, a smaller, better metric. So here's our old system uh, without our our processor extensions to make things fast. The latency is 30 seconds. The cost we're just going to say it's C. We don't really know what it is exactly, but it's 
uh, it's something. With the new system, we have a latency of 21 seconds. And this, we're just kind of getting from kind of the, we aren't really computing this other, any other way besides just looking at our, um, our pretty pictures. And the cost is 45% more. So it's 1.45 times C. Okay. So if we, if we look at latency times cost, um, and we're effectively gonna do kind of a, a speed up, if you will. Um, it's not really dealing with latencies, but you, know, you do the same concept. Uh, uh, to be able to compare these two, two numbers. Uh, and we have the old one is 30, which is a latency times C, which is cost. The new one is 21 times 1.45 over C. If you divide the new by the old, um, what we get is that one, it, it turns out to be 1.015. And so that means that the new one is bigger the, the numerator is larger, so it's it's a worse it's worse according to this metric than the old one by 1.015x. Now, if we if we use latency squared times cost, we get a little bit different, right? These these 30 squared and 21 squared respectively um, are going to end up giving us 0.071 when we compare new to old. And so in this one, the new one is better. The denominator has to be larger. So um, according to this metric, it would be worth it. Now, which metric is the right one? Well, it depends on how much money you have and how much you care about latency, um, which is pretty subjective. But it's always good to, in my opinion, get um, you know, get as uh, get it, get rid of as much subjectivity as possible, and get some empirical evidence behind two sub uh, subjective choices. So, this is this is kind of the goal. Okay. So that's uh, an example of Amdahl's law in action, and in this case, it's kind of uh, pretty sad how how much um, where <laughs> how much is that performance gain we are kind of losing out on, if you will. Um, you know, it sounds really great on paper until you compute how much it'll, it'll actually help you. Um, as far as these cost calculations though, like you could just set cost to one as well, you know, it's, it's gonna cancel out. So um, that is another option. Okay. So let's formally, define what is this Amdahl's law. Um, it's called the second fundamental theorem of computer architecture because, you know, when you talk in terms of fundamental theorems, then it sounds really intelligent and you can write a paper. Um, oh, shoot, I'm dropping the tap from my water. Okay, so Amdahl's law says that if we can speed up a pro X of the program by S times, uh, the total speed up S total is gonna be given by this equation. And we ha have S total is equal to one over X divided by S plus one minus X. Okay. Uh, Let's do a sanity check just to make sure that this isn't totally uh, insane. So if x equals one, this would be that we can speed up 100% of the program. We can speed up the whole thing. Uh, what do we get? Well, we get that s total is going to be um, one over one over s, and then one minus x, which x is in this case one. This goes to zero. And then, you know, just one over one over S and then that's just S. So if we can speed up, if, if X is the entire program and we're able to speed up that by S times, 
that's going to be the, the total speed up, right? Um, that's what we would expect out of this equation. And as far Hey, Sumner, I don't know if you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Can you guys hear me again? Yes, yes, okay, cool. Yes. Yeah, not sure what happened there. Um, maybe one of Zoom's servers keeled over dead. Okay, where was I? Uh, did, did, did you guys have, how long has it been out? This is the real question. Uh, it was on this slide, but I don't know how to describe where. Okay, I'll I'll just go ahead and uh, re rephrase what I was talking about of these two for two last terms. But I think that that is probably what you missed. So this first term is um, is basically saying that the x part of our program. We're able to speed it up by s. So that's what this first term is is giving us. And then this uh, the second term is just saying this is the rest of the program that isn't affected by our optimization. Um, and and we're just assuming that one is kind of like the the entire uh, is the old, if you will, the old program. Okay. So let's take a look at the, the corollary, which is um, say that we're targeting X of the program. So we have some X percentage of our program and we want to figure out what the maximum possible speed up is for targeting this thing. Well, it's gonna be just one over one minus X. Um, why is this? Well, you can either, you know, just kind of think about it logically, or you know, you can maybe be a bit more rigorous and, and take a limit and look cool and be able to typeset stuff in LaTeX. Um, but the the idea here is, you know, as s goes to infinity, this is just going to go to zero. Um, effectively, we're getting rid of the entire x part of our program, so. Uh, that's that's how we're getting to this one minus x. We we no longer have x um, in our program. Okay. Questions before we do the worksheet problem. Let me um, pull up this and I'll, I'll move that over to the side and then I will, I don't know where I'm going to put this. There we go. I think that should be good. So I'll give you a, a minute to do this.
Um, okay, where is it? Right, there we go. Okay, so let, let me just go ahead and copy over this Hamdahl's law. So we know that X is, is We also know what the speed up that we need. We're trying to get at 10 hours faster from 200 hours. So again, we can we can kind of equate this, our speed up from Amdahl's law to the, the speed up that we can just compute normally. So old over, over the new. So the old one is 200 hours. The new one is 190. Um, and then we can compute for S int, which is what we care about, right? The speed up required uh, for the integer unit. And, you know, uh, and then, I guess we can pull this over. And then I guess invert again. Over Should I do algebra right? What did you guys get for your an for answers? Anybody have have a a number? One point one point three. Yeah, that sounds right. Cool. Okay. So this is an application of Amdahl's law, and we're also using kind of the the old definition of speed up over over here. Um, and we're solving in this case not for the total speed up. But we're kind of doing the reverse and solving for the speed up of the 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 thing that we want that we have control over the speed up. Okay, so what about 50 times faster? What number do you guys get? Okay, not possible. Definitely not possible. So let's, uh, let's get an explanation. Yeah, so we only have 40 hours to work with. Okay, so how can we see this? Any ideas to, to show why we only have 40 hours to deal with? Yeah. Well, I mean, so you said integer operation takes 20% of the time. 20% of the time, yeah. So, no matter how fast you make that, you only ever take 40 hours, right? I mean, you've made it, you know, yeah. Faster, yeah. Right? you only take zero. 
yeah so so we can we could maybe even use our corollary right so our um uh where where is it um so our max speed up right is going to be is going to you know if we if we use this and compute out um um the the total speed up is you know 1.25 uh the other way obviously is you know just saying like well as you were as, as jason was saying 20 if we can just get rid of 20 percent of the program that's only going to be 40 hours um but another way of, of thinking about this is um that this is the max speed up that we can get but the speed up that we need is is actually um you know 200 over 150 which comes out 1.3 i think and so obviously not possible the max speed up is less than what we can get or the max speed up is less than what we need so this is another way of showing it uh, again what your explanation of like if we eliminate 20 percent of the program we're, we're gonna uh down to zero that's only going to give us 40 hours that's acceptable as well um another way of of doing this if, is if you just like don't realize that immediately you can actually just do this computation up here and it'll be negative which is kind of impossible so um if you have a negative speed up you know that it's impossible and that's what you would get if you if you did this with the new numbers okay any questions So we have another uh, worksheet problem then. This one is is a comparison. We're we're, we're we have two different options, um, and we're going to use Amdahl's law to determine which one is going to be the better trade-off, the better option. Okay, so we have some graph processing co processing code, and we have some information about the instruction mix and the time that each. Are, are spent on each type of instruction. So 20% of the time is integer ops, 35% of the time is IO. And we have two different things that we could do. We could just get rid of 25% of the integer instructions. We're going to assume that the integer operations just are still the same latency. Or we can uh, reduce the latency of each IO op by uh, by one microsecond from six to to five. Is that micro or I think it is. Whatever. They cancel out.
Okay. Um, let's just write down the facts that we know. So the integer operations take 0.2 of the time. And the speed up is going to be, um, well, basically, we can just say like 100 over 75, for example. Yeah, obviously. And then for, for the IO. Why is S int 1 over over 75? So the speed up of why is S int 100 over 75? Great question. So what we're saying with this is that uh, before integer operations took just, let's just say, 100 units of time, now they take 75. That's equivalent to saying that there's a 25% reduction in, in, um, in the time spent on integer operations. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, and what's the speed up for, for IO? You'd have a hundred over sixty five, right? Mm, I don't think so. Six over five, yeah. Six over five sounds more more correct. So again, we're looking just at the a speed up uh, that we get from the problem. So we have six down to five, and the units are the same. So we can ignore the units because they get divided out. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe I should. Um, Do that. Okay. And then we just plug into Amdahl's law. Um, so the speed up again, just 100 over 75. And what speed up did you get for the for the first option, the integer operation one? 1.05. .05. And for the IO ops, 1.06. Did every any anybody else get a different answer? No? Okay, that's probably good. 1.06 is the answer, and this one you can get from, again, applying Amdahl's law. Six over five. Okay. Any questions? I want to make sure everyone understands this. All right.
Um, X is always the percent of the time that you're doing something. I, I think it would be more precise to say X is the amount of the program that you can target for this specific optimization. So, um, like here, the reason why X is 0.2 for the integer operations is because 20% of the time is our is what we can target for optimization for integer operations. Um, and it's 0.35 because 35% of the time, 35% uh, of the program can be optimized by optimizing IO. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, um, by the way, this is probably fairly accurate as to which is better to do. Generally, IO latency is, in fact, going to be your bottleneck or your best, best choice for first optimization. Um, so, you know, this is an entirely just made up as an example. IO is expensive, but not as expensive as programmers. most of the time, luckily for us. Okay, so <clears throat> this leads us to Amdahl's corollary, which is that we should try and go and make the common case fast. Um, so that is, we should pick whichever X is the largest, right? Or close to the largest. Um, and this allows us to, you know, affect more of the program, which is a good thing, because then we can uh, we can get a lot more bang for our buck, if you will. Another way of thinking about this is, you know, to start with the large rock. You know, if you're cleaning up your file system, for example, because you're running out of disk space, you should go for the big stuff first. Like, um, you shouldn't go just go start deleting PDFs like small PDFs out of your documents folder, you should go and like target like your VMs or whatever. And it's the same idea here. We we need to start with the large stuff first. Oh, keep tripping over this chair. It's really embarrassing. Um and by common what we, we're talking about is is this runtime. So we care about the um the time that it's consuming, not how frequent it is, right? For example, in the in the previous uh, worksheet problem, right? Um, I I O is you know takes a different like there may not be as many instructions necessarily as there are integer instructions, but it's still taking a uh, longer longer of a time. Um, and then if we just go and optimize you know, uncommon cases, it's not gonna help us very much. And I would say that this corollary applies to software engineering quite heavily as well, right? I, I'm sure we've all all done this where we optimize an uncommon case, you know, we're like, oh, this, I wanna apply out my algorithm knowledge to this, even though I know that the N cubed solution is totally fine because N is only ever gonna be like five. Um, you know, I don't know, I'm pretty guilty of that. <laughs> Until part two of Advent of Code, which uh, as you can see, I'm wearing, rocking the Advent of Code shirt today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're not wrong. Um, but again, you know, mm, premature optimization has, I would say, uh, bankrupted many companies. It definitely bankrupted Netscape. I would, I, I will, I'm pretty sure that's pretty much why they, they're no longer a browser or a company at all. Um, and it's really important to actually figure out what the common case is. And this isn't entirely trivial. You have to do some profiling. You have to like, you know, 
can't just take random guesses. I mean, you can, but it's you 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 might then optimize something that doesn't need optimized. Um, and it really is going to depend, right, on all of the things that we've discussed, like that affect CPI, for example, inputs, compiler optimizations, your algorithmic optimization. Everything can affect this. So, um, you know, you might optimize for one case, and it is like really efficient for that. But in the general case, it may not be. Um, and then you just keep doing this until hopefully you're hopefully once once you've applied an optimization, then your un, your common case becomes less common, and then some new common case will emerge. Um, and then you, you you should you should aim for that for optimization. Um, so here's a here's an example in, in kind of a, a picture again. Look for the common case. In this case, it's it's this magenta. I don't know, purple. Anyway, we're really great at at uh, optimizing. Maybe maybe we decided to take Take it. We decided to actually make it uh, O of n instead of n cubed, and now it, we got a seven x performance gain. Um, so this is a um, a total of one point four x from this to here. Now we look for the next common case. In this case, it's the gray one, uh, and we're able to get a, a four x increase. So a total of 1.3 times performance gain. Uh, and then we look for the next common case. It's this kind of light blue. We get a 1.3x uh, increase in performance for a total of 1.1x. And so we've actually gotten a total now of a 2x performance increase in our program. Um, and you know, it, it's not exactly clear what the most common case is at this point. Um, so maybe we're fast enough, like 2x is pretty decent. We might be fast enough, but if we're not fast enough, we have some other options. We can do some global optimizations, uh, for example, just get a better computer. This is often a reasonable approach. Um, better compiler, you know, you can, we can buy the proprietary Intel compiler that has all sorts of crazy optimizations and nobody understands them. We could, um, divide it up differently. So instead of thinking about kind of maybe, maybe in this case, we're thinking of functions, you know, this is the, this is the, the like parameter parsing. This is the file output at the very end. And this is like your, I don't know, matrix edition. This is some, some setup, you know, stuff like that. Instead, maybe let's just focus, let's just segment this out into um, classes of instructions instead. So we have memory instructions, floating point instructions, and focus on those uh, instead. Um, or, you know, another another thing to look at Function call overheads, which are pretty extensive, if you remember from Comporg, like having to do the store the program counter, move the stack pointer, not screw up the stack pointer, put all the stuff in the correct registers, save the registers. You know, there's a lot of overhead there. Um, so maybe try and get rid of some of that. Um, in the end, uh, you might just have to, you know, blow it all away and, and redesign. And we're all probably pretty good at that at this point. OK. Uh, questions on the second corollary? So. Amdahl's law applies to both single core 
as well as multi-core scenarios. Um, and we can use Amdahl's law uh, to bound the speed up that we can get from parallelizing some program across our P processors. Okay, so if we have uh, a program that runs on a single core currently, and we're able to parallelize X of that program across our two cores, um, then this equation is going to give us the maximum speed up that we can get. Okay. Um, and by P way parallelizable, I mean we can take X of the work and distribute it across P cores. Okay, so what happens if, if for example, X is 100%, then, well, which is never going to happen, unfortunately. Um, then it's just your speed up is just going to be the the uh, the number of cores that you can that you can use. So if we can go from one core to two cores with a hundred percent parallelizable, then our speed up is going to be two x, which kind of makes sense. Um, unfortunately, that's never kind of the case. So um, this is going to bound our maximum. Uh, possible speed up. And basically our speed up is always going to be P. You know, this is this is base this is the the number of cores. And uh, since we can parallelize out across P cores, that means that it's gonna be uh, like a, a P times speed up. Um, for, for that program, for that part of the program. Um, you know, it, it's fairly difficult to actually do this. Increasing X for, uh, for a large P, you know, a lot of times we can, you could distribute it across two cores, you know, without, without pulling your hair out. But um, on a lot of desktop applications, that's really not possible. Uh, so this has actually been a, a really interesting to see, to kind of watch browsers try and do this with like CSS and JavaScript and everything, and trying to because as as we as we discussed earlier in this class, right, we aren't really seeing any performance gains just purely on the processor uh, clock speed side. So we're having to parallelize to get additional performance um, and. So, you know, the amount of the program that we can actually parallelize to even two cores is often fairly small, but it's non-zero and, and it is to the point where a lot of times that's what's necessary to get a little bit more performance. Um, so yeah, if you, if you just have more cores, you aren't gonna increase your performance necessarily. Some programmer has to actually parallelize the program so it can take advantage of it. Um, and that's non-trivial. You know, like the AMD Threadrippers, you have 64 cores, but it's not any good if you have a single core application. Okay, so this leads us to another worksheet problem, which is um, basically we're able to, to quadruple the number of transistors we can fit on our processor die. And um, currently our customer can use four processors for 40% of their application, okay? So we have two different choices. We can, with the additional four times the number of transistors, we can just add, make four cores. We're just assuming that all the cores, you know, aren't gonna like, they can all just fit on this, on this quadrupled number of transistors, that's maybe a little bit inaccurate, but we'll just go with it anyway. Or second option is we can increase the numbers, number of processors from one to two, but we're gonna make them a bit, the core is bigger with more features and it will, those new features will allow the application to use two process for, 
processors for 80% of the execution time. And the task is to figure out which one is the best choice. Oh, and I should, let me. Pull up the actual thing for you. P is the number of processors across which you can like perform this X part of your program. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody have an answer yet? Which option is better? Option two, there's a vote for option two. Okay. Yep, so that is the better one. Let's, let's, see, let's see why. Um, okay, so we have this, we, we're, we're again just wanting to compare two different speed ups and uh, using this, this new Amdahl's law for parallelism. So for the quad core case, we can speed up 40% of the application. So that's going to be our X. And the speed up is going to be four because we can distribute it across these four cores. And so if we just plug this in, 0.4 of the application, 4X speed up, and then obviously the one minus 0 0.4 here. You guys at 1.4. Uh, for the dual core case, we can um, target 80% of the application. So we're our our x is going to be larger, but our our speed up s is only going to be two, because two two cores. And I got like 1.7, 1.67. This isn't chemistry, so I don't really care about sig figs. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, uh, bigger speed up is better. So option two is better.
is there a version of this equation for figuring out from going from N to M processors? It's a good question. Um, well, so one, I would say that, let me, let me think here. You can basically just, um, instead of one up here, oh God, that was, that was supposed to be an arrow. Instead of one, you can, you can kind of just, instead of, uh, as, instead of having it be one, you can have it be, let's see here, like S of going from like, Duo to quad O point eight over two. You can put you can put the this as your numerator and then your denominator can be can be the same. I think this will give you what you want. Because again, it's just old over new. So the question again was what if if you wanted to to know the speed up between going from two cores to four cores, what would that be? Um, and again, uh, this is kind of going back to the old definition of speed up from before, right? Where we just have the the old over the new. And this is the old one. This is the two course system speed up. And this is the um, uh, four core. And I, uh, did, has anybody like computed this out? I, I'm guessing it gives you a less than one. It, it better gives you less than one or else, uh, or else this is wrong. Um, Yeah, that, that looks like it should be less than one. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I would say, yeah, it's again, um, to answer the question of, is this even a useful thing to, to think about? I would say, yeah, um, definitely useful to think about whether or not we, uh, we should go, how far we should go. Uh, this is a good way of determining kind of where are we get diminishing returns on adding more cores. And, uh, along these lines, um, uh, I would say that like being able to feel comfortable with kind of manipulating the equations to your needs for whatever you're trying to evaluate is very important. So, uh, you know, maybe something that isn't just straightforward Amdahl's law shows up in some other context, like, I don't know, an exam, you know, that's, it's always good to be able to, to uh, manipulate to your needs. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. What exactly does speed up represent again? So like, uh, what is the speed up represent? 1.7 yeah. would be um, 1.7 times faster than what it was. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, um, yeah, what, is this, what does this actually tell us? It's a great question. It's saying that it's going to be 1, 1 1.7 times faster than before. Um, and so this is a, this is a bigger is better metric, right? We, we want more speed up. 2x would be like saying that we have a 2x speed up is equivalent to saying the latencies halved. 
between the two, the two things we're comparing. Okay, yeah, any more questions? Okay, so let's talk about the fourth corollary. We've kind of already seen that we can combine uh, our old definition of speed up with the latency of the old over the latency of the new one. Um, and we can rearrange this though a little bit and just, just get ourselves um, uh, the, the new latency in terms of the old latency and the speed up by algebra, which you know, I messed up a lot of algebra, but it's fine. And then we can apply Amdahl's law. Uh, so we can we can just plug in Amdahl's law in for the speed up, right? Because it gives us it gives us our our total speed up um, for for targeting x of our program and speeding it up by s. Um, and then just rearrange a little bit. Obviously, this is kind of ugly down here. So let's just move it up and multiply. And we get that the new latency is just the old latency times x over s plus one minus x. And then that gives us our, oh, distributed in, and that gives us our MDOS law for latency. And this may be useful for like uh, approximating or, or getting an actual value for the new latency if you if you apply some uh, optimization again this isn't necessarily a precise science because you know if you knew everything about how the processor is working and how everything is interacting this would be an exact science but we rarely have that luxury um, you know you might Uh, change some part of your program and think that it's optimizing it and then for some reason it, it doesn't actually do that it, it makes it worse because of something that you weren't thinking about um, but this is a good way of like I expected that the latency would go down by this much would be this and if it's not anywhere close to what you had uh, estimated then then maybe you should look into oh uh, other other things that might be causing your performance issues. So, Amdahl's law does not bound slowdown. So this is not a corollary. Um, if we if we take our Amdahl's law for Amdahl's corollary for you know the law for latency, and we we just kind of look at this equation. What we notice is that latency of the new thing is 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 proportional to x over s. Um, and so, you know, let's just say that x is 0 0.01 of our execution. The latency of the old one, we'll just say it's one. Um, if our speed up is very small, meaning that it's a, a very big slowdown, right? Um, what we end up with is that it's it's a, a 10x. Um, the latency is is 10x, which is bad. Bigger latency is is very bad. Um, and if our speed up is even smaller, again, meaning that it's a really big slow, an even bigger slowdown. We get a thousand times latency um, for our new for our new thing. So, um, as you can see, you know this is this is only one uh, one percent of our program, or yeah, and and it's and it's very very negatively affecting our our performance. So things can get uh, only get so fast. Amdahl's law bounds how fast it can get, um, but it doesn't have any bound on how slow it can get. You can make it as slow as you want. 
Um, so it is important to, you know, not hurt the non-common cases too much. So it's a balancing act, right? You might be like, well, I can triple the, or, you know, quadruple the latency of something that takes 10% and reduce the latency of something by 2x that takes like 40%, it's probably not a good trade-off or maybe a good trade-off. So, and you have to, you would have to actually calculate that and see which, whether or not the trade-off would, would be appropriate. Okay, so let's go to a new example. This one's tricky and don't do it on your worksheet yet. So let's just say that we have a bunch of memory operations. They take 30% of the time and we have a new widget, it's called cache, that speeds up 80% of our memory operations by a factor of four. And then we have this second new widget called L2 cache that speeds up half of the remaining ones, remaining memory operations by a factor of two. So the question becomes, what is the total speed up? So you might just be like, well, it just, you just apply it one after the other, right? So if we try and do the L1 cache optimization first, um, we, we speed up by, speed up is uh, uh, four. So this is a factor of four thing. So speed up of the L1 is cache is four. Um, and then X is that, um, 80% of the 0.3 of the 30% of our memory operations can be optimized. Okay, so this is the amount of our program that is going to be affected by this 4x speed up. And then we just plug in the numbers, we get the speed up of the L1 cache um, is just 1.2195. And then let's just go ahead and apply our, our second optimization of the L2 cache. So we speed up the L2 cache by two. So that's the speed up of, of, this, of this optimization, right? We, we go back here, factor of two. And um, X of L2 is going to be 30% of our program. And then it said of the remaining memory operations, so 20%, this is the, the other, the, the complement of this, I guess. And then half, um, half of those, so half of the extra 20%. And this is 0.03. And then we just uh, apply this. Um, and we get 1.0152. And then we combine them, just multiply them together. We get 2.2347. And the question is, is it right? Who votes for it's right? The multiplication isn't right, okay. Anybody have a, yeah. I probably did that wrong, didn't I? One second. Let me. Uh, classic adding instead of uh, multiplying, I think. Um, let me just check something real quick. What did I mess up? Yeah. I think I just typoed the two. Yeah, good catch. I'll fix that. Okay. Okay. Ignoring the fact that the multiplication is totally wrong, what else is wrong? <laughs> Uh, 
let's uh, let's take a let's take a look and and see. So here's here's a, a picture of what's going on. Our first our original program we have uh, seventy percent is not memory, so that's we don't have to care about this. Um, and then of our of the rest of the time, the thirty percent that's on memory, um, twenty four percent of the total program is this L one memory time, um, and then point oh three and then point oh three, so three percent for both L two and then just isn't going to neither optimization is going to apply. Um, and when we first apply our first optimization, um, where we speed up L1 by 4x, it now goes down to 8.6% uh, of the execution time. Um, and it takes, point, uh, and it's now at, at point oh six of the original total execution time. And then what we can do is we can have our L2 time down to 0 0.015. And if we do the computation, we, we end up with a, a speed up of 1.24. So again, 1 over 0.8. 05 is how we get this number, which definitely is not equal to whatever I have over here, but ignore that it's a this is a two, say it's a one. 1. 1.23 is not equal to 1.24. So what happened? Kyle. Yeah, the memory operations are no longer 30%, right? At this step, they do not constitute any 30% of the, the total anymore. So our second optimization is actually going to target a larger percentage of the total than before. Um, so yeah, that's the, that, this is the problem. And yeah, Amelia, you have it. I think you have it right as well. Um, so the conclusion is we can't naively apply these optimizations one at a time with Ambell's law. That's not going to work. Um, and exactly what Kyle was saying, uh, after we compute the speed up for one optimization, the execution time changes. The total execution time changes. So the fraction of the execution that the next optimization affects is going to go up, which is, which is good, because it, it means that the speed up is going to be actually greater. So how do you do this correctly? Uh, and this will, I think, eh, we'll probably end here. I'll, I'll, I'll defer the worksheet until next week. Um, you can start on it if you want. But here's the here's Amdahl's law for multiple disjoint optimization. So, given n disjoint operations, uh, each of which speed up x sub i of the program by s sub i, then we're going to get a total speed up given by this equation. So we have our s total, then x sub one over s sub one, x sub two over s sub two, etc., all the way down to s sub i. Uh, x sub i and s sub i, and then plus one minus, and then all of the x's summed together. Um, so what does it mean to be disjoint? It's important that these are disjoint. Um, so let's just say that we have uh, some x sub i and x sub j pair. So some optimization x, let's just say x1 and x2, s1 and s2, 
must not apply to the same portion of the execution. So back in our pictures, right, uh, our first optimization of this L1 cache only affects these. And then the L2 cache optimization only affects this part of our execution. So they're disjoint, they're, they're not uh, related. Um, so that's gonna work. We're gonna be able to use the, uh, this equation. So let's let's talk just briefly about how what these terms mean. Like basically, where what this is saying is that one minus the sum of all of our x's. So these are the this is the amount of the program that we're able to optimize with some optimization. Um, and then we're saying, okay, all the rest is going to say that stay the same as far as latency. And then we're going to be able to speed up all of our X distinct parts of our program by their corresponding speed ups. And that, that's what this kind of uh, sum is telling us. Okay. We'll go ahead and uh, end here. I'll stick around if you have any more questions. And worksheet for this lecture will not be due until, will not be due this Friday. It'll be due right after.